full. Now you see why I don't get asked too often. When he's tired or sick or hurt or don't have nobody else, he'll say, well, I go, just go down to the, go down to the pot. The old dude will be laying in the bottom. In the book of Joel, chapter number two, blow the trumpet in Zion, verse number 15. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Now, if we rewrote this today, it would read, build a bigger building. Serve a green noodle dinner in the back room. Bring in a professional band. Hire some minstrels that can sing and carry a tune in a bucket. Joel didn't write it like that. He said, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breast. Bring them in too. Get the babies. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and let the bride come out of her closet. The homosexuals came out of the closet and said they created that. No, the bride was the one that needed to come out of the closet. Well, you can't get this just anywhere. One of my favorite sayings is they're not preaching this at Joel Osteen's church. Let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, the priests, the ministers of the Lord, today that would read televangelists. The casual folks, the progressives, that would read that way this day. Let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, and let them say, spare thy people, O God. Now I skipped a sentence because nobody likes to hear that. Let the priests and the ministers weep between the porch and the altar. Why? Because you cannot get to the feet of Jesus while you're standing on your own. You can be seated. Thank you. You've been standing a long time. Nowadays, we stand more than the Catholics. I don't need to give you an update on the latest news. I don't need to tell you what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. You know all of that. I don't need to tell you that Putin is threatening us with nuclear weapons and he's going to do this. Nobody's going to do anything unless God allows it. Nobody. Not the communist, not the socialist, not the Marxist, not any of, nobody can do anything unless God allows it. The devil can't do anything unless God allows it. Just can't happen. Oh, the devil's trying to kill me. The devil can't kill you. He can't hurt you. He can't give you cancer. He can't give you sugar diabetes. He can't give you anything. He can't do anything unless God says, okay, you can do it. And he can't kill you. He told him with Job, he said, go down there and take everything he's got, but don't hurt him. The devil came back for a second dose, said, well, yeah, but it's only because you got a hedge built about him. He said, okay, go touch him, but you can't kill him. Not unless I say you can. And if I say you can kill him, it's because I got something better for him. The problem with us today is the better things that God has for us, we're afraid of. We're so afraid we're going to lose something that something's going to be taken from us. Oh, my God, what about my 401K? Oh, my social, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Jesus said, look, don't worry about what to say. When you stand before the devil and all his folks, I'll put words in your mouth. And don't worry about what you're going to wear because I clothe the lily of the field. And don't worry about what you're going to eat because I feed the sparrows. Every bird's going to get fed because I take care of them. Ladies and gentlemen, at what point in this game are we going to go back to the basics and remember that Jesus Christ is with us. He loves us. He's going to take care of us. No weapon formed against us can prosper. We are not in bad hands. We're in good hands. All states stole that from God and they can't produce. But Jesus Christ can produce. 
You're in his hands, every one of you, sinner or saint. Whether you come to church or don't come to church, you, your next breath is dependent upon what he says. Every one of you. And at the close of the day and at the close of time, if you don't know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, then you don't know him at all. You don't get bits and pieces of Jesus. This is not Reese's pieces or God's pieces. It's a whole unit. You take the whole package. We effectively, over the last 500 years, I should say 1,000 years, have divided the Bible up to where it's a crossword puzzle. And we leave a lot of blanks. And we add to and we take from. We make it say what we want to. And if it doesn't say what we want to, we'll rewrite it into a new translation. We want to make this thing palatable. Don't want to offend nobody. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I want you to go home happy. You have to go home. That's what church is for. That's what people say. That church is a place where you can go and be happy. Then you can go back to the bar and get unhappy, but you'll know next Sunday you'll come back here and get happy again, and you turn it on and off. It just doesn't work that way. Jesus Christ is a 24-hour, 365-day-a-year program. You, you serve him the same every day. You love him the same every day. He becomes a way of life. And if he's not a way of life, then he's not in your life. If you know a method that you can substantiate through the Bible that teaches you can have part of Jesus Christ, I want to know that scripture. You can't have nine fruits of the Spirit and you say, I got three of them. Because there are not nine fruits of the Spirit. There is one fruit, singular, of the one Spirit. And that one fruit is composed of nine components. Love, joy, peace, all of those are one part of one fruit. And when you get the spirit inside of you, you have all nine components. Why? Because you have the whole deal. But thank God for vending machines. It's where you put a quarter in and just get the one you want. I remember when they first came out with vending machines. You can't remember that. You don't even know what a vending machine is. Don't sit up close if you don't want to feel the heat. We've invented everything in the world to try and make life easier, easier. Microwaves, when we, first microwave I ever received was here in Burnett, Texas. The church gave it to me. $800 they paid for a microwave. They're $39 at Walmart. $800 because we had never seen them. It was the same way with everything. The first VHS, VCR, that came out. $800 to $1,000 for that thing. Now people ask you if you'll haul them away if they give you $5. Amen. Come on. See how we've changed? You think the devil's been silent? No. He's been working very hard, working, working very hard to take you away from what, what you should know and what you should do to distract you. He is a master at distraction and division. If he can divide you and her, he'll wipe your home out. If he can divide you and her, he'll destroy your children. If he can divide you from the body of Christ, he'll take you to the lake of fire and tell you it's a great place to go. It's a vacation land. It's Florida in disguise. I'm going to tell you there is only two destinations you can travel to. One of them is heaven where the gates of pearl and the walls of jasper and the streets of gold and no need for the sun or the moon for the Lord God Almighty and the lamb or the light thereof. That's the place you can go. Or you can go to the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. That's the second death in Revelation. That's the final destination. And you decide where you're going. So folks, it's smoking or non-smoking. You pick what you want. Nobody chooses it for you. Don't talk about how much you love your children while you allow them to walk a path. That will destroy their eternal soul. I see these women nowadays. Oh, I love my babies. No, you don't. If you did, you wouldn't be on drugs. 
No, no. You wouldn't be an alcoholic. You wouldn't be taking food off your table to buy alcohol. Don't talk about how much you love your children while you help kill them. Whew. You asked me to come. I didn't ask you if I could come. I'm not here to tell you how great things are. I'm not here to tell you we're going to have a parade Sunday morning and everybody's going to, oh, we're going to have a time. The floats are going to be great. I'm here to tell you that we're living in the closing days of time and that we're going to do this thing called the rapture that everybody's been waiting for. You think Starbucks is an accident? No, they wrote stories about them. Oh, yeah, when, when it comes, well, and he comes, well, there'll be a bunch of us left here. That's, that's the way they've, they've interpreted it to say now. They've, they've, they've weaseled this thing down so that it's not so bad when Jesus comes and you get left behind. Have you lost your mind? Really? So they said, we'll all meet at Starbucks. When he comes, everybody gather at Starbucks. We'll have a, a chocolate-flavored coconut latte made with, with goat's milk or oat's milk or something kind of milk. And, we, man, we'll have one, seven or eight dollars a cup. And they got millions of people a day driving by Starbucks paying seven eight dollars for a cup of coffee. And said, well, I don't know how we're going to pay the electric bill. Don't drink no coffee that month. Don't drink no coffee. Because you have Dr. Pepper and any of that other stuff. Stop drinking that. And see how much money. You, do you understand the point here? We only wear certain kinds of clothes. We look at the tags. We don't look at the shirt. It says George in the back. That came from Walmart. I'm not wearing that. It says Van Heusen. Say, write me up. That's a name. That's a name. We are so concerned with image that we forgot we were created in the image of God. And, and the image that God created and the one that you, you create don't correlate with each other. He didn't create you to look like that. He didn't mean for you to look that way. We're never satisfied with what we got. We're never satisfied with how we look. We're never satisfied with where we're going. We always want to change things up. Whew. Boy, I'm tell you, I'm having a great time. I don't know how y'all are doing. You're either going to do it his way, Jim, or you're doing it the wrong way. There are not multiple paths that lead to God and lead to heaven. There's one road, one road, one road, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father. There's only one of everything. You choose the right way or you choose the wrong way. You can't be on neutral ground. You can't say, well, they're going to heaven. This one's going to hell. I'm going to Switzerland. That don't work. Switzerland's a neutral country. It's not a neutral resting stop for everybody after the world ends. And there will be sad singing and slow marching. So I hope today you will consider who you are, what you are, who made you, and where you're going. And it's not going to change. When you leave here, you can go find some place that will make you happy again. <laughs> I'll get away from this if I can out of sight, out of mind. I can forget that. Man, some, get me that coffee. Get me to Starbucks so I can wipe away what that guy just said. You ain't wiping this old dude away, I can tell you that much. And you ain't going to wipe away what I said. It's going to follow you out of here today. We better get our heads screwed on straight. Why are we doing the things that we are doing? We're following the pattern that the prophets told you were going to happen. We were prophesied about all of this. Everything that's happening right now, you may not have known it, but there were prophets all over the country, all over the United States that were prophesying what was going to happen in America. But there weren't that many of them, but there were a whole bunch of them were saying, hey, 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 it's a coming, baby, it's a coming, while they skipped up and down in front of the pulpit dressed like some kind of a circus clown saying how much God's going to do this. We're going to have a great revival. God's going to bless us all. Everybody's getting a new car. Man, your wages are going, everything's going to happen. That really worked out well didn't it did you know that a record number of so called prophets had to go public and make national apologies for the prophecies they made four years ago because none of them came to pass not one came to pass do you think that's the first time that ever happened no see she moved she's trying to get away from me I know her. I love her. I'm just playing with her. She knows that. 
We're doing everything we can to change the ending, and you can't change it. You can't change the ending. I've got family in here today, several of them, daughter, son, wife, uncles. No, I ain't got no uncles. Brother-in-law sitting back there. I'll run him off before I get done. We can't change nothing. Do you understand that? You can't change nothing in that book, but you can change you. You can change you. You can't change God. You have to change you. That's the only way it'll work. God's not in need of being fixed. God's not broken. You can't chase God. We sing about chasing him, but you can't chase God because he's not running. And he has no place to run to. He inhabits all space. So how can we be chasing God? Or how can God be chasing us? God's not chasing you. Not one scripture in all the word of God supports that. God's not chasing you. God said, you want me? Draw nigh to me. You make the first step. Draw nigh to me. I'll draw nigh to you. You come to me and I will in no wise cast you out. But I'm not going to run you down, pick you up by your heels and shake all the, the, the bad things out of you. You come to me. If you want me, you come to me. But when you come, I will give you more than you ever imagined having. More. Why? Because he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all things that you might ask or think. He can do the job. He can heal you. He can heal your husband. He can heal your children. He can heal your mother and your daddy. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above, but he won't do it in a co-partnership. He does it when he's the ruling and reigning fella. Nothing more, nothing less. I want you to, just for a moment, in the book of Mark, how do I do all these things? How do I make this happen? It's good to see Brother Fowler. I've known him for over 50 years. He didn't look good then. He don't look that good now. No, he actually looks the same. Paula told me one day, she said, Doug never changes. I said, I know, I don't know what's up with the dude. Michael and Crystal, it's good to see you. This story in the book of Mark that I'm going to allude to, you cannot come to God empty-handed. And you cannot come with a list of what needs to happen, what needs to be done. When you come to God, you come with nothing. It's just saying, God, I'm not making no requests. I'm not telling you got to do this, that, or the other. Here I am. I want you to change me. I want you to take over in my life. It's a complete takeover. Doesn't, it can't be a hostile takeover because God won't force himself on you. It has to be a, a takeover by mutual consent. I want this, Lord. I want the best that you have to offer. What do I need to do to get it? How can I make this happen? Well, I'm going to tell you. In the book of Mark, they come to Jesus, and there's a man in the crowd. They're, they're having a discussion. Jesus has noticed that there's a crowd gathered, and the scribes are there, the Pharisees are there, and a lot of people are there, and they're arguing over something. Can you imagine that? We argue over everything. We're divided over everything. Why? Because a house divided can't stand. It can't stand. So we're divided over everything. In this room today, there's division. And if you go on Facebook, Facebook is, is filled with division. And there is an onslaught right now to attack people like me and what we, what we believe. I believe this for 55 years. And it worked all those years. Why would I want to change? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Why would you buy a brand new Porsche and then go home and tear the engine down? Who would do that? I can tell you it's an easy answer. It's not politically correct answer, but it's a good one. An idiot. Yes. Come on. That's who would do that. Well, the Bible's not broken. God's not broken. He doesn't need fixing, and especially to be fixed by you. What do you have to offer God? Who, who are you that God should be mindful of you? Every breath you take, he gave it to you. 
Go outside, dig in the ground, find a bug. God put him there. Everything about God. He does everything and he does it right. And he loves you more than he loves anything on this planet. All he wants is you. It's like a marriage. When you get married, why do you marry somebody? Because they're handsome? Pretty? Is that the reason you marry them? No. Those are things you hope for. But that's not why you marry them. You marry them because they're rich? Or what reason? Well, you marry someone when you love them. If you marry anybody for any other reason, you, you made, made a bad mistake. And if you don't love the person you marry, you damage it, that person the day you marry them. They become damaged goods. So with God, we come to God because we love him. We can't see him, but we know he's there. How do we know he's there? Take a breath. Right now. All right, now take a breath and hold it for seven minutes. You can't because God gives you that ability to breathe in and out. And every breath you get comes from God. Amen. Every breath. You can't see him. But they used to think the same thing in the Bible. We can't see him. But he said the wind, when the wind blows, you see the presence of God through the results. The trees are shimmering. We know that he's there. But folks, sometimes... We have to get out of our box. We have to move forward. Draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. I think we talk about revival this, revival that, and all these guys are prophesying revival on the Internet and on, on Facebook, on TV. They're everywhere prophesying this great revival. They don't even understand what a revival is. Revival is an improper term for what God's going to do in the last days. God's not going to do a revival necessarily. He's going to do a restoration. He's going to restore a lot of things that have been lost along the way. He's going to, he's going to restore what was taken in Joel's prophecy where I read a while ago. If you read a little further, he said that the palmer worm, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the locust destroyed a whole lot of the things that God had given his people. He said, when I do this thing in the end time, I'm going to restore everything that they destroyed. I'm going to bring it back. That's what God's going to do. But he's not going to do it just because you said to do it. There are certain things that we're, there's criteria. You know, I regret that we've reached a place. Son, I, I do. We've reached a place that the criteria, you can't mention criteria no more. You said, well, there's criteria that has to be tended to. Well, no, we don't have no criteria. You know, everything is everything. And now we say, well, I'm trusting in God. Well, I put faith in God. My faith is in God. And we, they're, they're super spiritual people that say their faith, their faith, their faith, their faith. That's not possible. If you've got faith in God for everything, stop going to the bathroom. Call me up. Tell me how that worked out for you. Stop eating. You men, stop going to work. Well, some may have already stopped that. <laughs> stop going to work. Do, do you understand the logic here? Let me repeat myself something I've said here before. If God said to me, I'm going to let you be God for one day. If you want to add something, I'll give I'll let you. Now, this can't happen, so don't leave here and say that I'm preaching false doctrine. It's hypothetical. If God told me that I could add something, you know what I'd add? I'd add a, a, a tenth gift to the nine already there. You know, the, the gift of the word of wisdom, gift of the word of knowledge, and speaking in tongues, all that stuff. I'd add one to that. I would add the gift of common sense. Common sense. What do you do when you're hungry? I just lay in the bed and wait for God to send a raven. Well, you won't have to worry about getting heavy. You'll feel fine. God will take care of you. No, God takes care of those that make the effort to take care of themselves. If you don't take care of yourself, don't expect God to take care of you. We're good at building buildings, but we don't do real good with building a temple. And your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The temple of the Holy Ghost. So it's up to you to build that temple. And it's not an easy task. In fact, it can be quite complicated. 
but it's only as complicated as you make it. So these guys are arguing and fussing and fighting. And all at once, they come to Jesus. And they, he asks them, he says, what's going on over there? And when the crowd sees Jesus, they immediately run to where he is. And when they get over there to Jesus, he says, what's going on over there? I said, well, they're all over there arguing about this, this boy here, this man. And this guy chimes in all at once, the dad does. And he says, I have a son. And he said, he's, he's got a, a mute spirit is what he called it. He couldn't talk. We don't know if he could hear or not, but it said that he couldn't talk. And he said he, he throws himself into the fire. This is in the ninth chapter of Mark. He said he throws himself into the fire, and he, he, he leaps into the water, and, and it, he tries to drown himself. He said he just he has horrible, he's having a horrible time. And he asks this question. He says, but if you can do anything to Jesus, but if you can do anything. Now, to ask God if is rather rhetorical because there's nothing God can't do. So the if there, actually, Jesus is the one that was supposed to have used the if, and he did. He says, if you can believe. If you're able to believe, don't ask me if I can do anything. I'm going to tell you that if you can believe, and for before he could even answer, he said, Lord, I do believe, but help my unbelief. So wherever belief is present, unbelief will be there as well. That's why you have trouble with decisions, because you're wrestling with belief and unbelief. That's why it's hard to, people say, well, I'm going to make a decision for Christ. You can't make a decision for Christ. You have to, he, he's not in limbo. You have to make a decision for you. And that is that I'm going to turn everything over to him. I'm going to surrender all of my control to him. I'm, I'm going to move me out. The middle man's going to get out. And I'm going to put myself in a place where he can touch me, where he can save me. And when he did that, Jesus said, if you believe, all things are possible to him who believes. All, don't take that out of context. To him who believes, they're talking about a child having a devil and that devil being cast out. And so when Jesus has heard enough, I love what he says. It said, when he saw the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, not the mute spirit, not the deaf and dumb spirit, but the unclean spirit. There's only two kinds of spirit, clean and unclean. When he rebuked it, he said, I command you, come out of him. Then he stepped into our future, and he used a song that they used to sing in the, in the honky-tonks. Hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more. That's the only place that Jesus did such a thing is right here. He said, get out of him, and don't you ever enter him again. So there was an injunction that came with a commandment. The commandment was come out. The injunction was you're not welcome back and you're not coming back. That boy could never have a devil again. That is powerful. How much do you want from God? Do you want just enough that will get you going on Sunday morning so you can make it to church and feel like you paid your dues. Do you want just enough that will cause you to come down here and drop something in that offering plate or in the, in the bucket or, or whatever they carry around or put it in an envelope or, or send it in the mail or do it online? Do you want just enough to get you through that? Or do you want just enough that you can, can, can stand right on the fringes of good and evil and make it through? Ladies and gentlemen, he wants your whole heart, your mind, your body, your soul, your strength. And he's not trying to take anything away from you. He's not trying to punish you or hurt you. He's trying to help you. He wants you to know that I will do whatever I need to do to save you, but you have to yield to me. And if you're not willing to yield, then he cannot help you. Would you stand with me, please? We have had multiple revivals, as we call them, over the years. 
They started way back. In fact, in the 1700s, they had multiple revivals. They had them not just here. They had them overseas. There was a tremendous revival in Ireland. And it was an actual revival. They were reviving something that had died. Then in the early 1900s, we had the Welsh revival, 1905, 1904, 1905, over in, in, in Wales. We had the revival in Northern Ireland in 1859. We had what they called the Great Awakening. There were several Great Awakenings that began back in the early 1700s. The colonies began that. People in the colonies were already try, trying to make a move toward God that was greater than what they had. They came here so they could worship God without retribution. That was why they were here. That's why they fled England to get away from anarchy. But in the 1700s, they realized we don't have enough. We got to have more. And so there was a revival that broke out amongst the colonies. In 1859, the American revivals began. In 1860, revival broke out in Jamaica. In 1859, the Ulster Revival, which was in Ireland, one of the great ones, one of several that were, books were written about them. There were the visitations of grace in 1859. Why is 1859, 1860 so important? Because just prior to catastrophe, God has always sent some sort of move of God. So right before the Civil War broke out, the presence of God was falling everywhere. What causes that? How what just God got his place circled on the calendar? No. In every one of these occasions, and there's more, there's there's a lot more that, that you're never told about. Everybody nowadays wants to think that they've come up with something brand new. They go down onto sermons.org and find something that was preached 55 years ago and go home and rework it and put bigger words in it and say, who have heard from God? No, you just stole somebody else's sermon. Then you have these guys that go and do sorts of things like that, or they'll re come up with a good one and preach it, then they want to copyright it. Oh, they say, well, I'm copywriting, that's mine. First time I've been preached. Well, I guess we'll throw Peter and James and John and all them in the garbage. That's where you got it. How many did you get from Spurgeon? How many did you get from Evan Roberts? How many did you get? How many did you get from Seymour? How many did you get from, from Charles Finney? We're not in a competition. He and I, you, Michael, we have, Braden, Nick, we have one thing in mind. We're here to, to save these people if we can. You don't have no other goal. You're here to see that you can keep these people saved. Get them saved, keep them saved. Too many people today say, well, I got a new revelation. Yeah, I was saved 40 years ago, but I don't agree with what they did. They were all wrong. Well, evidently, they were good enough to get you. They just weren't good enough to keep you. So you have to change it to suit your appetite. And that was why Joel said in his writings, God said, call a fast. And all of the, well, the revivals that I just mentioned to you, and there are many more, you can look them up online. Everyone was preempted by fasting, preceded by fasting. People were fasting. It may have been an old widow woman. Who knows? But someone was fasting and praying, and it moved the heart and the mind and the hand of God. Total surrenders. God is not looking for a peace treaty. He's here for a total surrender. If you're not willing to raise up the white flag of your life and say, God, I'm out, I want you in, then you cannot have a relationship with him. But if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to walk down here this morning, this is the altar area. That's where sacrifices are made. And we talk a lot about presenting your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. That's more than just a statement to where you say, God, I present my body to you a living sacrifice. Because every sacrifice that was accepted by God, the fire came down and consumed it. So if the fire of God doesn't move in your life with your sacrifice, then your sacrifice is not what it's supposed to be. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. 
So you have to be holy and acceptable. You say, well, that's why I'm coming to God. That's right. You're coming down here to be holy and acceptable to him. Doesn't have any, doesn't, doesn't matter how you're wearing your hair. It doesn't matter what kind of clothes you're wearing. None of that matters. I am content not to tell you how to dress or how to wear your hair. I'm content to do that. You know why? Because I know what's in that book. And I know that when you get the real thing, I won't have to tell you to do nothing. You'll do what you're supposed to. And you'll do it right. Because they that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. So if you're not led by the Spirit, you are not the Son of God. And if you're not led by His Spirit, you'll be led by the other one. Remember, there's only two kinds. The good one and the unclean one. And you will listen to what He tells you. But today, it's a great opportunity to say, Lord, I've done done it my way long enough. I've done it my way long enough. My older brother that died in February, he loved that that song, I did it my way, and he did things his way. It didn't work out real well for him. You have to surrender your way. There is a way that seems right. Looks, don't look bad. It seems right. But the end of that way is death. But there's another way. Jesus said, I am the way. And if you come to me, I won't cast you to the curb. I'll take you in, wrap my arms around you, tell you how much I love you, and as long as you want to stay here in my arms, you can. But any time you get ready to leave, you can go. So if you think you can walk away from God just because you feel like it, and you say, well, nothing happened. (laughs) Nothing happened. I left. God, you said I need to do this, do that, do the other, and y'all got all these rules, regulations, and everybody's qualm. They're having quarrels over all that business. Well, I did it, and nothing happened to me. So, nothing happened to Adam and Eve when they ate the fruit. And they'd been told they was going to die. They didn't die. I could just see Adam almost standing outside the garden saying, <laughs> nothing happened. And then one day he went over to pick something up. And he said, oh, what was that? One day he looked in the brook and saw his, his face, no mirrors. He saw his face and he said, my hair. This used to be black. These wrinkles, where'd they come from? You see, when Adam stepped outside that that garden, he started dying. Dying, death is death, no matter how you get there. I've never heard of anybody dying and coming back and saying, you know, I really didn't like dying in a car wreck. I'd rather somebody shoot me on a drive-by shooting. See how ridiculous that is? Death is death. You start dying. When we come out of the womb, we start dying. It's just that simple. So nothing happened. I used to smoke. First cigarette. My mom and them told me, said, you can't don't smoke. That's bad for you. This was before the Surgeon General got involved in the 60s. My first when I first started smoking, I was young, man. I started smoking and they said, don't smoke them cigarettes. They'll kill you. And mama was smoking one. She smoked a lot. And I smoked it and I thought, nothing happened. Mama was wrong. By the time I got grown, <coughs> tried to climb a flight of stairs with a cigarette in my hand. And I was young. You understand the, the logic here? That first drink of alcohol, ah, they told me it'd kill me. Nothing happened. Hang on. 45 years later, Uncle Charlie goes to the doctor, got chest pains and all that stuff. They x-ray me and said, man, you're covered in cancer. He goes home and everybody says, God, how could you do that to Uncle Charlie? No, Uncle Charlie did it to himself. God doesn't kill any of us for no reason a whole lot of us are committing suicide wouldn't it be a great day to say God suicide's not on the table here I'm going to turn myself to you lock stock and barrel I'm going to put my trust in you I'm going to put my hope in you 
I'm not going to just go up and shake his hand and shake her hand and hug them and say, oh, we love you, blah, 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 blah. Here, I bought you a gift card to McDonald's. I'm not going to, no, no. Go up and say, hey, pastor, put me to work. Get, help me to be faithful. Help me to be faithful to the house of God. All of you that are here right here today, thank you for being here. And don't worry, I won't be here Wednesday, so you'll be safe. Come in here Wednesday. Because if you really love God, you won't stick to Sunday. If he calls a prayer meeting, he has a right to do that. Call a solemn assembly. Remember me reading that? Who has a right to do that? The man of God has a right to do that. So if you trust him with your soul, listen to what he says. If he calls a prayer meeting, come. That's a solemn assembly. If he calls a meeting of all the people in the church, come. That's a solemn assembly. Why would I do that? Because you want to follow the word of God and the path and the way of God. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Today. The music's good. It sounds good. They'll probably sing a good song. Whatever it takes to get you to come down here and make a commitment to God. I hope it's happening right now. I hope that you will do that. I hope you will do that. Would you come? Would you, would you be willing to do that? Anybody? Just make a commitment to God. That's all. Just a commitment. You don't have to go sell all your goods and, and give them away. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Just make a commitment to God. And then let Him direct your steps. Follow the Spirit. They that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. Go ahead. Get in that boat. I want to be led by the Spirit. You can't be led by something you don't have. So it's just that simple. And there's no age barriers in here. Doesn't matter how old you are. It's still the same. Even old people can be effective. In fact, they're usually more effective when it comes to praying and, and seeking God. Awareness. So anyone else? Not asking you for no money? Nothing, just... Would you just make a commitment to God and say, I'm going to live by this commitment. I'm tired of broken promises. I want to make a commitment to you, God. Now, I know this is not all. Folks, the time, the time's getting away from us. The clock's ticking on us. At some point, 